If you are worried you have Lyme disease or just like the outdoors and want the peace of mind of knowing whether you have Lyme disease or not, there is a new Lyme screening test based on decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at VCU Medical Center. For more information, visit glymedx.com. That's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X.com. Or email at info at glymedx.com. Infectious diseases. Research. Medicine. Health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Well, hey everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. In, and in our running series on parasites, we're going to look at another tapeworm, the dwarf tapeworm or Hymenolepsis nana. And joining me, as always, is parasitology expert, author, and friend of the show, Rosemary Drizdell. Hi, Rosemary, and thanks for joining me again to discuss these little critters. Oh, good evening, Robert. My favorite critters. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, where is Hymenolepsis nana infection found, and how common is it's it? It's actually found worldwide, as is usually the case with parasites that can pass directly from one person to another. It's very common. There are about 75 million people infected with Hymenolopus nana. And in temperate regions, the, uh, the largest group of people who are infected tend to be children. Uh, it's thought that there are perhaps less than 1% of the population in the United States, but as high as 9 or 10% in some countries such as Argentina. Now, how does someone uh, get infected with this tapeworm, and who's most at risk? There are a couple of ways you can get infected, and uh, probably the most common way in humans is simply to ingest the eggs that have been passed by another human. So it's a fecal-oral transmission kind of thing. Children are most at risk because their hygiene perhaps isn't as good as it could be, and anybody who lives with poor sanitation as well. And, and how infectious is it? It's infectious in, in that it's, it's directly transmissible from one person to another, so it doesn't require an intermediate host. That makes it easier for the parasite to get from one person to another, of course. And also it has an auto-infective cycle. So once you have one tapeworm, you tend to accumulate more because the, that one can proliferate without you having to be infected again from the outside world, so to speak. And like I said in the intro, um, H. nana is also known as the dwarf tapeworm. Uh, Rosemary, can you talk about the morphology of both the adult and the egg stage of H. nana? Sure. As the name suggests, it's rather a small tapeworm. I think if I had been naming it, I perhaps would have called it the miniature tapeworm. Mm -hmm. The difference in size really is that significant if you compare it to the larger ones, like the beef or pork tapeworm, which can grow to be meters in size. But Hymenolopus nana only grows to perhaps four centimeters at the most. So it is a very tiny, delicate little worm. The other thing that's different about it is that you can have a lot of them, whereas with the larger tapeworms, you tend to only have one. It has a scolex, as most tapeworms do, with a set of hooks, a circle of hooklets on its, on its nose or on its uh, scolex, with, with which it attaches to the lining of the intestine, and also some suckers. There are four suckers on the scolex of it as well. The eggs are also quite different from the other tapeworms that we're familiar with. They're quite uh, beautiful, actually, delicate-looking eggs. They have an outer membrane and then a space and an inner, inner membrane, so it's almost like a little sphere floating inside another sphere, and in between a, a set of very fine hair-like filaments that lie sort of floating free in that space. Within the inner space, you see the oncosphere of the tapeworm, which is basically a, a larval scolex with a set of hooklets that are quite easily recognized when you see it under the microscope. Rosemary, can you talk about the life cycle of Hymenolepsis nana? 
Yes, it's interesting. As I said, most people probably become infected when they ingest the egg. So if we start from there, where you swallow the egg, it will hatch in the small intestine. And the larval stage, the onchosphere, will invade the intestinal lining. It actually heads for the little lymph vessel. Each one of the villi in our intestines has a lymph vessel, and that's where they go. They only spend about a week there, and then they emerge again into the, the lumen of the intestine, attach there, and grow to be adult tapeworms. So those adult tapeworms are hermaphrodites. They are both male and female at the same time. And um, viable eggs are passed to the outside world. Although, as I mentioned, there's an auto-infective cycle. So some of those eggs will hatch and complete that life cycle without ever leaving the host. If the eggs are passed, then they can be consumed by another human being, of course, or they might be consumed by a rodent. And actually, it looks like Hymenolophus nana has a a uh, variant, um, another very, very similar, almost identical tapeworm infests rodents and beetles. And it's probably, um, it probably, these two probably diverged relatively recently. So we can also catch Hymenolopus nana by eating a grain beetle, perhaps a, a, the tapeworm that is cycling through the rodent and grain beetle side could infect a human and vice versa. So it's quite uh, diverse in its mm -hmm. life cycle. Absolutely. Um, Rosemary, mm -hmm. can you describe the signs and symptoms of, of an infection with this tapeworm and how serious can it get? Yeah, fortunately, uh, most infections are asymptomatic. The person doesn't even know they have the tapeworm. And it's usually only in cases where you have many, many, many tapeworms living in the intestine where you do have symptoms. Then it would be similar to other tapeworm in infections, perhaps some abdominal pain, diarrhea, nausea, headache, and dizziness have been described. It's usually not a terribly serious infection. Right, right. Now, how about the diagnosis and treatment of H. nana? We diagnose it by finding that very characteristic egg in stool specimens. So in a, in a parasitology laboratory, we get a stool specimen in and do a concentrate on it and look for those eggs. They are, when you see them, they pretty much jump right off the microscope stage at you. Mm -hmm. And it can be treated with praziquantel, which is a common antiparasitic drug. Sure. And can you talk a little bit about the prevention of this parasite? Yes, it mainly rests on good hygiene. So washing your hands, uh, people who have the tapeworm hopefully will wash their hands after going to the bathroom and the rest of us wash our hands before and, and after touching any objects that might be contaminated. Good sanitation makes a big difference. And I think that uh, one of the main reasons why we see less of it than we used to is that our grain stores are better protected from rodents and grain beetles now than they used to be. So we don't pick it up from, from that cycle anymore. All right, and to close, Rosemary, how about a Hymenolepsis nana story? I've got one for you, and sure. I, I just finished telling you that this is usually a, not a very serious infection, but I found a report in the New England Journal of Medicine from just a couple of years ago that is quite impressive. There was a gentleman in Colombia who was infected with HIV, so a human immunodeficiency virus, mm -hmm. and he was found to have... Um, nests of cells in his lungs and lymph nodes and lymph vessels that behaved like a cancer, but when they looked at them under the microscope, they found that they really didn't look like human cells. They were small, much smaller, and they thought that they might be perhaps some kind of animal cell. He was found to have Hymenolopus nana living in his intestine and was successfully treated for that uh, tapeworm infection. However, these little nests of cells didn't respond to the praziquantel. Nevertheless, they were found through DNA sequencing to be cells of Hymenolopus nana. So what appears to have happened there is that uh, stem cells or the early cells of these tapeworms had somehow invaded his, uh, his lungs and his lymph nodes. And of course, people with HIV, their immune system is compromised, so they're not really fighting off things like this the way the rest of us would. And he was unable to fight off those little uh, nests of cells. So he basically had 
malignant nests of tapeworm cells hmm. living, metastasizing in his body. Well, that is clearly unusual. Isn't it? Yes, Isn't it? it? Is. Yes. Yeah. Well, you never... And so tapeworms aren't bad enough. Having nests of tapeworm cells <laughs> metastasizing through your body is pretty horrifying. Yeah. Well, you never disappoint with the stories, Rosemary. And I want to th- <laughs> I I wanna, love them. I want to thank you once again, Rosemary Drizdell, for your time and expertise. Thank you very much. Always my pleasure. You're most welcome.